Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started here in a minute at right at noon. Yes. And then we'll also be live on the City of Georgetown Facebook page. So if you have friends on Facebook who'd be interested in watching on that platform, they can catch us live and on Facebook here in about a minute. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we are live, Anne, and it is Thank noon. You. So welcome everyone to a very special edition of Tuesday Talks. We are normally the first Tuesday of the month. I'm Britton Bostick, the City of Georgetown Downtown and Historic Planner. This is Anne Evans, reference librarian and local history expert. <laughs> Uh, so it's so fun to have a colleague right next door who knows so much about history and has great resources to share with us. Anne knows a ton about our two buildings that we're discussing today and celebrating birthdays for, so I'm excited about that. But we do want to get started with a little bit of information and updates for y'all. Uh, we have some exciting news to share with everybody. You've heard us talk about this before, but we are updating the downtown and old town design guidelines. So those are our two historic overlay districts they have special protections and design review requirements for projects in those areas, and that helps Georgetown keep its historic character. We really love telling the stories about the places, but it's a lot easier to tell the stories when you have those places here. So as we celebrate National Historic Preservation Month this month in May, we are also going through a process to update our design guidelines, the special requirements for projects in those in those areas. And so if you go to historic.georgetown.org, you can click this blue button to get more information on the whole project. We had an open house virtually. We were able to record it. That was last week on the 28th. And so you can watch that open house. You can watch our consultant, Post Oak Preservation Solutions, lay out what the proposed changes are. And then you can access the proposed update right here through this set of links. So we have the full document available if you want to read the whole thing. If you're only interested in certain parts, if, for example, you're only interested in the parts that apply to Old Town, or you're only interested in the parts that apply to signs, you can go straight to those chapters and skip over the rest. So we've got all of that linked for you there. We've also got a quick survey if you've watched the open house to help us get some feedback on your experience. And then also if you want some follow up, we are happy to do that. So that's a really fun ongoing project. We are taking public comment on this draft proposal until May 14th. So you have about a week and a half to get comments. You can contact me directly if you have questions or need more information. You can call 512-930-3581 or you can email historic at georgetown.org um, or you can visit the planning department office. You can visit us at 809 Martin Luther King Jr. Street our front door is across from the front door to City Hall. And so if you need to visit in person and that's more comfortable for you, you're welcome to stop by. Although it might be easier if you call and make an appointment and uh, make sure if you wanna to talk to me specifically, uh, make sure that I can meet you and talk to you about what those updates are. So that's an exciting project and we're really glad to launch this month. Um, but the other thing that we're really glad to be launching, of course, is our 
Tuesday talks that go every single week. We are doing all the history and all of the celebrating uh, this month and, and just so excited to be able to share with you some places that we really love, some places that we um, have enjoyed uh, for a long time too. I say that, you know, there are a lot of residents in Georgetown who've been here a lot longer than Anne and I have, but these are places that are special to us and celebrating some pretty significant landmark birthdays. So where we wanted to get started is the center of our downtown, the Williamson County Courthouse. And Anne knows a ton about it, uh, but I'm gonna take you back before the courthouse to get started and share a little bit about with you um, these old documents that I really enjoy and get to work with sometimes as a, as a city planner. So what I'm showing right now is the Georgetown deed in the original plat of Georgetown. So what this means is when uh, George Washington Glasscock and Thomas Hewling sold property to Williamson County to get it started, they, uh, they did so for $1 and the naming rights for George Glasscock. That's how we got Georgetown. It was named after George Washington Glasscock. He was a pretty notorious Texan. He had a lot of really uh, influential friends Glasscock County uh, to the west of us is named after George Glasscock and he was a pretty uh, large landowner. Uh, Thomas Hewling was a state legislator and so even though he was involved he tended to be a lot uh, less um, kind of at the forefront of their business dealings. Um, and so he was I believe an attorney also. So these gentlemen sold property to the brand new Williamson County. It had been carved out of Milam County on a petition from residents who said hey, we're tired of having to go to the Milam County Courthouse to do business. We want a, a courthouse closer to us. And so they cited it right on the San Gabriel River, uh, kind of up on this hill with this beautiful overlook. And they platted or they established the lots and blocks for the city of Georgetown with this hand-drawn map, which I really love so much. And what's funny is the courthouse is not in the middle of this map. The courthouse is the blank space you see toward the bottom right. And so the original town of Georgetown was to the west and north and kind of under that curve of the San Gabriel River. Uh, and then Georgetown was expanded after that. So a lot of people don't know the courthouse was not originally the center of Georgetown. It was the bottom corner of Georgetown and the square was the bottom corner of Georgetown. And so uh, between the courthouse and the San Gabriel River is really where Georgetown got its start. Um, but Anne, uh, we also had some pretty humble beginnings as far we as we did. <laughs> so you're talking about Milam District, um, which was the fifth the size of Texas. Just to give you an idea of why they wanted to carve out their own county, um, because if you wanted to get any business done, you had to go to Washington on the Brazos. So it would be a multi-day journey via horse, foot, or wagon. Um, so once the population was big enough you could petition the state legislature to carve out your own county, um, which they did. We uh, petitioned to be named either Clearwater or San Gabriel. The legislature chose to name us after Robert McAlpin Williamson, who uh, likely never stepped foot here. <laughs> we don't really know. Um, he might have. We, we just have no proof that he did. And um, the very first few meetings of the Williamson County Commissioner's Court, which was then actually known um, as the police court, began under an oak tree. So we had even more humble beginnings than this, which was the first uh, constructed courthouse, not the one that was open air. And this was about a 16 by 16 foot log cabin um, that would have sat around where Schaefer's Saddlery is, so where Hydrate is going in on the square where Mikey V's used to be, just to give you an idea there on Main Street. Um, and we used this for about a year after they stopped meeting under the oak tree until 1850 when they purchased a slightly larger, uh, about 20 by 20 square foot previously home log cabin that they were able to use until about 1857 or so. Then the third courthouse we had was the first one that was kind of in the middle of the town square like we think of it. It was also the first stone courthouse and possibly the first stone building in town. Um, unfortunately, it took them about seven years to complete and it was never actually what they wanted. It was never actually up to 
their standards. It never really fully came to completion in the way in which they had envisioned. So it was uh, not great to practice court inside of it. Um, there were a lot of also jail breaks because at that time and on the fourth courthouse as well, the jail was attached to the back of the building. Um, so you get a lot of jail breaks during that time as well. Um, so in finally around 1877, after 20 years of it just not being really inhabitable, uh, they built the third courthouse, which is the, or the fourth courthouse, sorry, which is the Preston and Ruffini. So we're actually on our fifth courthouse in Williamson County. Um, so I think on the next slide, there's a couple of photographs, or this is the, yeah, this is the first map when it is actually in the town square. Right. So this is from 1885 and Georgetown was almost 40 years old at this point. And we had already gone through a few courthouses, which kind of shows fourth how now. <laughs> we're on our fourth. Um, and so what we wanted to show really quickly is it was in the town square, but it was not in the middle of the block. Uh, like the current courthouse sits on. So it was kind of off center. You can see a jail indicated right there on the back. Um, there, uh, it was stone. We know that because it's indicated in blue um, on the on the Sanborn map, which means it was a stone structure. And they're showing things like assessor's office, county judge, uh, county clerk and county treasurer and the tax collector and sheriffs and uh, and also a courtroom. So they're showing kind of where everything was. They do have this funny note that I really love, and, and this kind of uh, relates to what Anne was talking about with the Preston and Ruffini, the architects who designed this really fabulous looking courthouse. It says uh, French roof slated, which means that that beautiful mansard roof that you see, um, it's a style that was more associated with French architecture, and it was built from slate, uh, which would have been a pretty heavy roof. It is something that you would have seen much more back in that time period when we had limited uh, options for roofing. We didn't have metal panel roofing. We didn't have standing seam roofing. And then the other thing I'll point out is you're seeing kind of a, a double square or, or more a double rectangle. There was a fence around the whole courthouse. Uh, and, and I think it's because we still had a lot of cows wandering around. That, that fence right? would have been really important. Actually, one of the biggest complaints um, on the square in the 1880s and 1890s was livestock getting into things. So <laughs> in particular, I know um, would often try to eat the hedges around the courthouse. It became a whole thing um, between the sheriff who at that time was in charge. That was part of his duties as sheriff was to wrangle livestock. Um, so we've come quite a ways, really. But it is a this gorgeous been, courthouse. Yes. So this would have been that fourth courthouse. Um, it was also the Preston and Ruffini. They designed several courthouses throughout the state of Texas. You can actually still visit some of them. Um, unfortunately, ours, again, was kind of plagued by construction issues and had problems most of the 30-ish years that it was in, a, in use. Um, so that was why the decision was made eventually to tear it down and build our fifth courthouse. In the uh, photograph, not of the band, but um, the other side, you can actually see some of the fence. This is a fence that was used for hitching. You can see a horse that is actually tied up um, there. So you can kind of see that it's, it's used multi-purpose. Um, keeping livestock out, but also keeping your livestock where they're supposed to be. Uh, and you can also tell in both of the photographs that it would have been dirt all around the courthouse. Um, so our dirt streets, our streets weren't paved until 1922 downtown. So it would have been pretty, pretty nasty. You would have gotten really uh, dusty at times. You would have gotten really muddy at other times. And Again, there's the livestock running around everywhere. So a very different atmosphere than we're accustomed to today. It's so funny to have that contrast of the, like this really ornate, elaborate, beautiful building and you're seeing, you know, dirt streets and there's uh, cows running loose and, um, and, and you know, clouds of dust and mud <laughs> and shootouts. This is still kind of the Wild uh, West. We're still yes. at the time of this beautiful courthouse. There are uh, shootouts there. happening <laughs> right, so, right over across the street, <laughs> right on Main um, Street. 
That's kind of incredible. So uh, we like to try to provide some context with the photos that we show. Um, we did have some big gorgeous trees on the courthouse lawn. Um, so that feels a bit familiar, but it's just so hard to kind of picture what we have today uh, versus what we had back then. Um, this is the 1910 Sanborn map. So we are celebrating the 110th birthday of the Williamson County Courthouse. And what is kind of an important transition to show is that uh, 1910, that building that you just saw got demolished <laughs> to make way for the brand new courthouse. And so uh, 1910 is, is the last picture that we see of it um, before it's gone. And then um, it, we came back with a, a new courthouse, the courthouse that y'all are familiar with, the one that's still there today, the one that is celebrating 110 years. So it was uh, started construction in 1910 and then finished around 1911. I think there were still probably a few details. And it's really easy to see this courthouse on the outside and go, oh yeah, we, we know, we've seen that. We've walked by it a lot. You've maybe sat on the steps to have ice cream or enjoyed music on the square uh, previous summers, uh, sitting under, under the trees on the courthouse lawn. But there's some fun secrets about this courthouse. Um, the architect was really famous in Texas at the time. His name was Charles Page. He designed the, the old Georgetown High School that's on University Avenue. It's now the Hammerlin Center for GISD, but he designed both buildings and Charles Page was known for courthouse architecture. He was known for a lot of prominent civic architecture in Texas around this time. He was an architect who was really focused on very modern things, although modern at the time was, you know, 1910, so just after the turn of the 20th century. This is a time period that we were really focused on uh, these kind of neoclassical or references to classical architecture, references to architecture in Greece. Um, it was a very solid, very sturdy way to design buildings. They wanted a sense of permanence. They wanted a sense of security uh, and really to convey this image of government uh, that was this very strong democratic thing. And so there are a lot of references during that time period not only in civic architecture, uh, but in inst other institutions, schools, banks. Uh, we'll pull that up in a minute and, and show you how this theme was, was carried on in that same time period, but really referencing back to uh, Greek society and Greek culture because of the themes of democracy um, and, and other themes that were really important to convey. Um, through government buildings. And so this is just a stunning design. I love these old photos so much. And they look so familiar, but Anne's going to walk us through the courthouse didn't stay looking like this. It it's didn't actually stay changed looking like this. quite a bit. Oh. So. But what is pretty fun is that uh, sometimes we've, through old photos, been able to get a glimpse of Georgetown from the courthouse. So this photo was taken. And do we have a date on this or we kind of have an estimated time frame? We have an estimate. So it would have been. Um, in that 19 teens era, you can see uh, what we know now as Grace Heritage um, in its first location of three, I believe. <laughs> um, so you're looking south on Main Street, that giant water tower right there would have been um, kind of in front of where the art center is now, because that was the fire station. Um, so yes, we can kind of have a glimpse of what Georgetown was. You'll also notice in this there, there are a lot of fences around houses. Um, going back to that earlier theme that we were talking about. Everybody's trying to keep the cows out. Everyone's trying so, to keep the cows out. So sometimes it's been really fun to have photos where we can see Georgetown from the courthouse because it was the tallest building around. Um, it still is the tallest building in our downtown. Um, but because it was even then the tallest building around, it provided a great vantage point for photographers. And we don't always know the purpose of the photographs, um, but sometimes it's really helpful when we're trying to understand um, historic development patterns, when we're trying to understand uh, where things originally were or what they originally looked like. Uh, so that, that you can kind of see this uh, ghostly looking church figure. This is kind of a funny photograph, the way that it, it got mm -hmm. developed. But Exposure, yeah. You, the so that's the Grace Heritage Church uh, that you see across on the other side of Main Street now and yeah. kind of a block further north that that church uh, kind of ended up ultimately kind of uh, flipping its location 
there's a lot of structures there that we don't have today. There's a lot of homes that are not there today um, because of ultimately the commercial part of downtown expanded out. Um, and so it's really great to have this perspective because it helps us to understand more about what Georgetown was like during those time periods. But we do have a, kind of a special guest, uh, Judge uh, Bill Gravel uh, wanted to share a behind the scenes tour for us which is really fun and exciting. Uh, not something that a lot of us get to do is hop up on top of the courthouse and get a look uh, from the very top. And so there are some particular things. I talked about the building style and its ties to uh, themes of democracy and, and hearkening back to the Greeks. And so Judge Gravel has got some fun information on that that he has shared with us via a video. And so one second and I will play that clip. Hello, this is Bill Gravel, your Williamson County judge. I have the privilege of officing in the most exciting building in all of Williamson County. That's right, our historic courthouse. And guess what? This year she's celebrating her 110th anniversary. She may be old, but she still looks grand and she still looks good. Come and check out our historic courthouse. One thing most people notice when they're looking at the dome are the four clock faces. A digital clock inside the dome keeps the time and keeps the gears moving. It tells the clock to move the hands on the clock face. However, the clock currently is under repair. The mechanical pieces on this clock are literally being rebuilt by a clockmaker. The clock was designed to ring a bell every hour just like this. The dome is made of copper and during the restoration, hell damaged was repaired on the dome. At one time, it was even painted white. Now, we enjoy the natural tarnish from the oxidation process, which also helps with weatherproofing. On the roof of the courthouse, we have lightning attractors, so that lightning hits poles and it's dispersed instead of hitting Lady Justice. It distributes the electricity to the ground and the electricity is taken away from the building. On top of the dome is Themis, the Greek goddess of wisdom and good counsel. In her hand, she holds a scale and a sword. The scale represents the weighing of evidence on its own merit, and the sword represents punishment, signifying that justice can be swift and final. She was removed during the restoration with a crane and cleaned, and then returned where she stands today. Thank you for joining me here on top of the Williamson County Courthouse, where we're celebrating National Preservation month. Thanks so much Judge Gravel for that behind the scenes tour. I have never been on top of the roof of the courthouse so that was a view and a perspective I've not gotten to have before and um, that's really fun. It's amazing how thoughtful all of these pieces are. Um, you know when you go through building design process you don't always get to have these really fabulous features like including a statue on top of the building. <laughs> yes. Um, or some other things, and we'll go into it. But um, but the architect who designed uh, this this building went so far as to even design um, the furniture, and uh, and that was really spectacular. All right, so we're back on our presentation, and uh, we wanted to stop on the 1916 Sanborn map because this is the first time we see the map detail for the current courthouse. So it had already been there for about five years. Uh, Sanborn maps were done periodically. They weren't done every single year. Um, it was kind of a costly process because somebody had to run around town and, and, and locate where everything was and draw it all out. And then the maps were produced in New York City and uh, somebody had to draw all these very straight lines and, and letter everything. And so it was, it was quite a process to get this done. So we have map from 1910, right before the courthouse, uh, the fourth courthouse got demoed to make way for the fifth courthouse. And so it's not till 1916 that we see it, but they had included a lot of detail that's really wonderful. And we have this building here today, so it's not that hard to understand, but this is the kind of information that's so helpful to us if we don't have a building here today to appreciate live and in person. So uh, it's noted as having a fireproof construction it's noticed, uh, noted as being built in 1910, although we know it wasn't completed until 1911. 
Um, and, and that's why we're at 110 years this year. It says mm -hmm. copper covered steel frame dome with clock on roof over rotunda. So if you're wondering if those are original features, we've got it in the photos and we've also got it right here. They're indicating that this is, um, that, that orange is the, it, it is a stone building. Um, it's not a building that's built out of fireproofing, um, but that, that orange was meant to indicate that this was a building that could withstand uh, a, a fire. This is a time period in which we're seeing a lot of fires in downtowns across Texas. This is, uh, you know, if you think of the Chicago and San Francisco fires, they were around the turn of the 20th century. There was a lot of concern that these wood frame buildings that cities had been built out of we're gonna catch fire. There was not a lot of way to control that rapid fire spread. And so fireproof buildings became very popular um, in terms of um, kind of providing some security, especially for a courthouse. You have important legal documents there. You have important legal proceedings there. You're holding prisoners there. Um, and so that was really critical uh, for them to be able to demonstrate uh, that, they, that they had a fireproof building. And that's why you see it in orange. So we've got three stories um, it's showing some balconies, it's showing some porches and porticos. Um, and then it also says the heat was from steam. So you have steam piped through the building to help heat the building. You have um, lights, the lights were electric, uh, I guess, rather than gas, brick bearing walls, rotunda supported by protected steel columns, reinforced concrete floors, and um, something or other supported by protected steel beams. So there was a lot of brand new uh, building materials going into this. Um, there was, um, this is a, we had gone from wood construction to uh, masonry construction, stone or brick. You can see in the blue that a lot of the buildings around the, the square were built out of stone. They were, they were mostly built from local limestone, but this is a period of time that you start to see brick construction um, a lot more. So some of the buildings are indicated in red. Those are brick buildings. Some of the brick facade, some of the building facades are indicated in red. Those are brick facades. And so this courthouse though had like a combination of materials that were expected to be uh, flame resistant and, and which, you know, the courthouse was at this point sitting right in the middle of the square. So it was pretty far away from everything else. But one of our, our hidden treasures and one of our secrets uh, that uh, and you you brought this photo um, of some some guys sitting at desk and it seems um, like maybe not the most comfortable working conditions, but there's actually a whole lot of history in this photo that I think is important for everybody to know. There is. So one of the biggest details of our courthouse that's really fascinating is CH Page actually designed things down to coat hangers and chairs and tables. So a lot of the... Um, and more historic things that you see when you go inside the courthouse, when you look around and you're looking in some of the courtrooms and things like that, are actually originally designed to be in that building. Um, so they're designed as part of the building, as part of its aesthetic. So there's a lot of consideration that was going into the courthouse um, and how it presented Williamson County to its citizenry. So just as a few little details next time you were inside the building to go maybe check out the district courtroom, look at some of those chairs, look at the jury chairs, um, look at the tables that are often in there and realize that some of them have been um, replicated from his drawings uh, during the restoration, but that a lot of them are original and that they were designed to be there. And we even have some of that furniture. Uh, Judge Gravel shared uh, some of the furniture in his office. These are some original pieces. So that prosecutor's table is part of the original furniture for the courthouse. And then we also on the left have this funny little table. It's a court reporter table. So if you think of somebody uh, making the court notes uh, in for movies, you might've seen somebody typing furiously on a very oddly shaped typewriter. Um, that would be a court reporter role. So uh, a very small table for a very specific role. Um, and so those are some of the pieces that are still in the courthouse and furniture selling. It's celebrating its 110th birthday uh, today too. Years. So uh, sometimes, <laughs> it's, 
Yeah, sometimes historic furniture is a fun find. Um, sometimes people prefer new furniture, but uh, some of these pieces really have some great longevity. We're looking at furniture pieces that have been in use for well over a century at this point. And so they've become really a very special part of, of what we're still preserving. So preservation is not always just about the building facade. Mm -hmm. It can be about the insides of a building too. So one of the things though that happened was around 1966, the courthouse needed repairs. It needed, they estimated about $100,000 in repairs at that time, which um, was about what the courthouse cost to build about 50 years prior. Um, and it just wasn't feasible with the county budget. They figured that out. The county budget at the time, just to give you an idea, was still about a million dollars, more or less. Um, so, so that would have been of the a budget? tenth of the budget. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, what they decided to do is that there were some aspects of it that were unsafe during that time. And it was largely pediments, putty heads, decorative ornamentation, the balustrades up at the top, which you saw in that video. Um, you could see, look out from the top of the building and the balustrades and see it. And um, instead of spending the money to repair it, they spent some money to just make it safe. And what happened is what a Southwestern University art professor, Robert Lancaster, called was the massacre of 1966. Um, <laughs> because they basically jackhammered off several terracotta pieces. They littered the courthouse lawn with them. Um, citizens, just people in Georgetown came and picked up chunks of like putty heads, which are like these little cherub looking angel decorative statues and took them home and put them in gardens. Um, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was quite a scene. Um, so it, it really changed the way that the courthouse looked for a long time. Um, just a few other things to point out about this photo in particular is you can see that the dome here has been painted white, which was alluded to earlier. That wasn't necessarily part of the uh, massacre of 1966 that happened a couple years prior. It was just a stylistic choice from what I understand. Um, you see a lot of that happening <laughs> in that time period, people painting things. Um, and it was in 1985 that they actually restored the dome to its copper color. So it was a very short period of time that the dome was actually painted white. The other thing I wanted to point out about this photograph in particular is in almost every single window, you can see a window AC unit. So it was not central air or heating yet at this time, still in the courthouse, even in the mid sixties. So from about the forties onward for a couple of decades, um, if you were walking by the courthouse, you would see a window AC unit in almost every single person's window. And you would imagine the noise of 40 plus window ACs running at the same time. <laughs> so it's kind of a different aesthetic than we're used to, um, but kind of going back to earlier, putting it all in context, um, 1920s, they didn't have paved streets yet right now this period of time, they didn't have the central AC in the courthouse. So it's gone through a lot of changes in its life. So take a look, especially at the roof line in this photograph where you can see the balustrades up at the top. And then I think it's in the next photograph, you can tell, yes. So the one with the fence around it, you can see that they basically just bricked off the top, the balustrades up there. They chiseled away a lot of the decorative pediment. The pediments are gone. Um, so there was a lot that was different. It's much more stark in its appearance. Um, and is not exactly the courthouse a lot of us are familiar with. If you were in Georgetown though, between 1966 and about 2007, the bottom photograph is the courthouse you might be more familiar with. Um, in 2005, so the period of 2005 to 2007, the courthouse underwent restorations as part of a grant from the Texas Historical Commission. In those pediments, those balustrades, all of that was put back in place. So it was a massive undertaking. Um, 
for about that entire time, about those two years, that fence was up around the courthouse, that kind of big, just plywood wall. Um, at points in time, it was kind of decorated with different things. So it wasn't completely uninviting, but it was pretty uninviting. Um, but it was a massive undertaking in order to restore the courthouse to its more of its original architecture, both inside and out. So um, at one point in the 40s, they had actually taken out the second staircase from the rotunda and put in an elevator. They replaced that staircase and moved the elevator. There were a lot of exterior and interior things that were restored during this uh, time period. I just wanted to point out too that Themis, when she was taken down while she was being restored and everything was being worked on, was stored at the Williamson Museum. Um, just to give you an idea of her size, the man standing next to her um, was the executive director of the museum at that time. He's about six foot. He's not a short man. <laughs> I don't know his exact height, but he is not, not a short man. He is definitely taller than me. Um, he may even be taller than six foot, but she's pretty large. She's pretty sizable. She had to have a crane lift her back up. Oh, wow. That's a lot of detail for a statue that's meant to be seen from a distance. Um, if you're familiar with the Texas State Capitol, um, the, the statue atop uh, the Capitol, they're much taller, but um, there's not a lot of the, the detail and the, the face from very up close. If you've ever seen photos, almost looks very grotesque because the features are so large, but when these things are designed, they're meant to be seen from a distance. And so there's an expectation that the, a lot of the very fine detail won't be seen um, because you won't really be getting up close. So uh, Themis had to be very large, but there's also, you can see with the hair, with the blindfold, um, you know, with the drapery, um, which is really beautiful. There, there's a lot of great detail there. So it's good to be able to see it up close too, um, because most of us, and, and certainly me, previously has only seen uh, from, from the street level, uh, kind of looking up. So I think it's important to highlight as we celebrate Preservation Month, um, that one of the reasons that we do this is because historic preservation has not always been um, a goal or a value for uh, communities across the US. And so the, the preservation movement um, in Texas really got started with the Alamo um, and, and, and really got started with women, women who are concerned about uh, preserving that part of our state's history and story and, and heritage. And so, uh, but the, and, and really kind of San Antonio has been a leader in historic preservation in the country. Uh, they have one of the oldest preservation programs in the country. Um, they're kind of on par uh, with preservation programs in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, uh, just for, for some comparison. But historic preservation as, a, as federal policy and, and as a large scale national movement really began in the 1960s. Um, and one of the reasons why is because we were losing a lot of historic fabric. We were losing entire historic neighborhoods. Um, we were losing historic buildings because uh, during that part of, of, our, of our, our time and, and our attitudes, the automobile was so popular. We had come out of World War II. People were very interested in very sleek, clean designs. Modern architecture was, was really popular. And you saw some huge stylistic changes. And so things like this neoclassical courthouse uh, or this courthouse that has like these references to Greek architecture, that had become really unpopular. Um, and you can see in this photo, a lot of the decoration got removed because it did not have the same value at that point in time in our preferences. And so we see that a lot in, in, during the middle 20th century. We see a lot of building facades being covered up. We see that in our square. Y'all have seen us show photos of buildings that got stucco coatings. The Gold's department store uh, got this big, uh, what we call a slip cover, basically a, a very modern streamlined appearance put over the, the existing Victorian building facades. And it was just kind of a, an odd time and, and a lot of damage was done. Now at the time, it wasn't really viewed that way, but as we continue to progress through these building changes, a lot of people said, you know, we really need to go a different direction. 
we really need to start with protections instead. And so in Georgetown in the early 1980s, we started the Main Street program. That has been a, a long effort that has resulted in the beautiful downtown we have today. It's provided so much support, not only for our downtown businesses, but for our downtown buildings and the reason that we're able to enjoy them. The Texas Historical Commission has offered grants to their courthouse restoration program for decades with the purpose of being able to repair some of the, the changes that were made during the middle 20th century. And so we are certainly not the only community, uh, not the only county that has worked with the Texas Historical Commission on that. They provide a lot of resources related to historic preservation, but they provide a lot of funding too for particular project types. And so a lot of the Texas courthouses that you're able to see today have been through that program and have a lot of very careful restoration work that helps to bring back some of these beautiful architectural features that may have been removed or replaced or somehow uh, just weren't maintained well enough to, to keep going. And so a lot of architecture firms have been involved in that. It's kind of a specialized practice and, and one that we're now enjoying here. So it's fun to see these details up close. Um, things like these magnificent clocks with the big bells. The fact that that's all still there is, is you know, due to the, the work of a lot of people who really value uh, our ties to our past in this way and the ability that we have to use these places to tell stories. And so uh, we have another place uh, somewhat related that we wanna share with you. Um, and this is kind of a fun story of another building that's gone through a lot of changes over time. This is one that Anne's very familiar with. Uh, yes. If you have recently been to the Williamson Museum, um, that's awesome. They are kind of uh, starting to, to get back to uh, what they offer our community in terms of events and activities. And so I hope you've been able to enjoy that. Um, but they did not start out as the Williamson Museum. That's oh. kind of a new creation. They started out much earlier uh, and had been through a series, not only of businesses, but also a series of buildings in this location that we now uh, kind of know and appreciate today. So um, yes, the Williamson Museum, built the Farmer State Bank building is also turning 110 this year. So it was built at the same time as the courthouse. Um, prior to this building, there had been several wooden buildings. Um, with a slew of different businesses, uh, dentist's office, grocery stores, um, billiards hall right there, and uh, all sorts of different things. And actually, if you go inside the museum, they have a three by three architecture or archaeology pit that was dug when they were doing restorations for their floor work. And you can see examples of some of the things that they found. Um, my favorite things that they found were bits of pool cue chalk, um, probably from the billiards that they were actually able to date from that time period because apparently the pool cue chalk formula changed in the 1890s. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's wild. So it, there was that and there was also uh, an intact molar tooth, um, which may have come from the dentist's office, most likely came from the dentist's office. I always like to imagine it came from a bar fight, but that's just a personal preference and probably not historically accurate. Um, so they found a lot of different things there that kind of gave clues about its past, but around 1910, same type time period, the Farmers State Bank had been formed a few years prior and they were looking to build a building. Um, so they purchased this and over the next few years, they actually built the Farmers State Bank. Uh, their original budget was about $9,000. They went slightly over. Um, they ended up spending about $20,000. What? <laughs> but. Whoa. There are those, all those lovely features that are in the museum now, which are the original uh, terrazzo floors skylights that are original to the building, marble wainscoting throughout the building, um, and of course, two different vaults um, that they use for bank purposes. So you can see that interior photo on the upper left uh, would have been about the time that it was founded. Um, the bank's president's office would have been that first little doorway 
And then the tellers would have been at those windows throughout. And then there in the back would have been the vaults. Just to give you an idea, you're looking from the front door inward. So this is kind of a wild evolution to me, and because this is one of, I've seen plenty of examples previously of buildings on the square that were demolished and replaced with, with new buildings. Um, but this one was kind of fun for me, uh, just from the details that I was able to see in the Sanborn maps. And yes. because we didn't have um, a lot of availability of photos of what this building looked like before it was the Farmers Bank building. Um, I wanted to kind of go through, so you, you can see in the in the map on the left where I've, I've got a, a box in in red, it says basically saloon and billiards. But the interesting thing to me is that that was a wood building. Uh, the yellow in the sandboard maps indicates wood frame construction. It was a wood building with a much smaller footprint and it had a wood canopy out front. So this is a building that would have had a canopy you could walk under um, kind of walking down the street or, or walking down the sidewalk. And then in the map on the right, by 1894, it had become a stone building. And we know that because it's blue. There was a little uh, kind of wood structure at the back, but the front of this building was brick. And I know that because it's got a red stripe across the front. But this building, when it was rebuilt as a stone building with a brick facade, did not have a canopy out front. Um, really, from what I can tell, it, it's not really showing what I would expect to see to have a canopy. Um, and so that was kind of interesting to me that this building went from, from wood to stone, but then also it had a brick facade and, and potentially no canopy. And that seems to be reflected uh, kind of the same way here. So one of the things that I think could have happened and you see this more on the east side of the square than you do on the west, but they very well could have had um, kind of a roll down fabric awning that would have protected from the sun. Remember 1900, 1910, we don't have air conditioning. We talked about, you know, the courthouse not having air conditioning until they got these window units. You can imagine how sweaty all the attorneys and judges and, and petitioners uh, would have been having to be in, in that very solid building, but um, just being able to have the windows open only. So kind of a similar thing here, when sunlight would hit building facades, it would really warm them up. And so thankfully this is facing east, so you're only really getting that morning sun. But it was interesting to me to see that there was not a protective canopy here. And then we get to 1910, and very similar to the 1910 map showed the fourth courthouse, not the fifth courthouse. And then same here, it shows the kind of previous building and not the, the, the Farmer's Bank building that we know today. 1910 when when those maps were they were done earlier in the year and so by the time we get to the end of the year and roll into 1911 we've got entirely new buildings that aren't reflected on these 1910 maps but by 1910 this building had uh it was stone it had a brick facade it had a wood canopy out front um, that you could walk under and it was noted as being vacant in 1910 and that was in preparation of what the changes were going to be for the bank to come in and so as we go to, oops, uh, this is supposed to be 1916 and 1925 maps. Uh, didn't get that updated. But by 1916, we can see this is a bank. It's still showing a stone building. And funny enough, it's still showing an indicator for a brick facade. But we know that that's not what the facade is. It's not brick uh, kind of like we would know it. It's a much larger masonry block that was used uh, to construct it. So. Um, I do have a lot of great use for Sanborn maps. They give us a lot of important and valuable information, but sometimes you have to do a little bit of uh, field verification, if you will. Uh, and then we can see that that wood canopy was gone. And so um, definitely in use of, as a bank. And by 1916, it, it's got those characteristics and those continue into 1925. So we can see pretty clearly um, that once those, once those changes were made for the bank, they stayed in place for quite some time. And then going back to the photos Anne was talking about, that's a lot of teller windows, and though was kind of my thought. It seemed like yeah. they were really prepared to do a lot of business. Would people have been going to the bank a lot during this time period? It just, it, it seems really prepared for, for a lot of uh, people waiting in line that maybe people I wouldn't think of. Yeah, and you would go to the bank for, I mean, all the things that we go to the bank for now, except also a lot of the things that we do via apps on our phone now, you had to go do in person. <laughs> Good point. Um, Good point. So, no drive-through ATMs. 
Yeah, there's no drive through ATMs. Um, there's no take a photo and deposit my check. <laughs> there's also a lot of things, you know, where your um, businesses and different people might be going and withdrawing money on your behalf because you have an account at a grocer um, and they're going and fulfilling your bill. Um, so there's different things going on, but yes, mostly it's that all of the things that we still need to go to the bank for or use our banks for, we had to go in person then. So the next time you're at the museum, be sure to check out those floors. Be sure yes. to check out that step where the president's office was that's now the yes. museum's front office um, and check out that beautiful marble wainscot. We were thinking, um, Anna and I were discussing this and, and kind of where marble comes from at this point in time. We think that marble was most likely sourced from Georgia. Um, marble is not all exotic. There were actually a, a lot of marble quarries in, in Georgia that were supplying marble to fancier buildings at this time, not only banks, but also hotels, civic buildings, et cetera. Um, whoever had the budget, you know, or was able to go more than double their budget, I suspect it had a lot yeah. to do with the finishes of the building. That's a lot of marble. It's a lot of marble. That is a lot of marble. Also, I wanted to point out, if you go in the building, look up and look at the skylights, because that is honestly one of the biggest features that people seem surprised about. But remember, we didn't, we had electric lights and it was obviously wired for electricity. But if you can use the natural light, they were wanting to use that as much as they could. Absolutely. So yes, they, be they, sure to look up have... and also, go ahead. I was going to say electricity at this point in time was not quite what it is today and no. also not nearly as reliable, not um, as if reliable. you can believe that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but also look up because there's egg and dart molding that is also original to the building. And right now during the month of May, the artifact of the month that they have at the front of the building is actually um, a piece of that that came off during the restoration. And when you look in it, you can see that the plaster is mixed with straw. And that is to make it lighter and easier to hang. That's wild. Yeah. So another example of a building that went through um, a restoration process, very, very intentional historic preservation effort so that we can yes. retain as much as possible of the original fabric or repair original fabric. And that's because this has so much value today. We don't build this way anymore. Um, and there are some reasons for that, but it makes these places that much more special and that much more wonderful when we've been able to see them go through these uh, restoration efforts. Um, so I want to share our contact information really quickly in case you have questions. If you're curious about anything that we covered today, um, want to know more or just need um, some quick links, if you have questions about design guidelines, you can email us historic at georgetown.org or you can call me 512-930-3581 or you can give Anne a call at 512-930-6614. We have some additional information that we want to share since we've been talking mm -hmm. about the Williamson Museum. They've got some really fun preservation month activities that we are really um, excited about. I've got some questions about, I've gotten some questions about this, so wanted to make sure y'all knew where to find this. The city of Georgetown um, is celebrating preservation month in a few different ways. We've got this beautiful exhibit of building watercolors at the library. The yes, library please. is open, so please stop by and check out that art exhibit. That'll be going on through this month. Yes, and then it's also Rachel Hancock. Rachel Hancock. So if you are familiar, uh, at the beginning of COVID, Rachel Hancock, who's a local artist, began doing these beautiful watercolors of our, our historic buildings and our downtown. And so um, if you have not been aware of that or not familiar with it, this is your chance to see her work on display. Um, it was really popular. You may have seen it on social media, um, but if not, this is a great chance to check that out. She's just done incredible work in capturing the essence of our downtown building. So that's a great thing to do this month. Anne and I will be back every Tuesday at noon in May, uh, sharing with you more information. Next week, we're going to talk about the historic post office, which is turning 90 years old. And we've got some fun stories and information about the history of the postal service in Georgetown. We're going to do a really deep dive on that one and, uh, and share with you some fun stories about uh, the post office and its evolution and then what the next steps are for that building. And then as we go forward through the month, we'll be talking about 
And am I pronouncing this wrong? I want to say it's the Milam building. Milam. Milam. So Mile Ham. Yes. You can see it up Milam. at the top on the west side of the square. It looks like twin buildings. It is twin buildings. We're going to be talking about that twin and pointing out a couple of others that you may not be familiar. We've got some building twins on our square. And then uh, we'll wrap up the month talking about the uh, the Lockett Building, uh, which is going to get a new business too very shortly here. And the Lockett Building is another one that started out with some more humble origins and has become a really fantastic facade. But uh, so sharing information about our partners, the Williamson Museum is going to do a marking history tour. I highly, highly, highly recommend this. So if you need information, you can go to williamsonmuseum.org slash museum dash events. I'm showing it here on the screen, um, I hope at least. And yes. so the marking history tour is going to be fabulous. It's going to be on the square. People are going to be in character for this. It's going to be awesome, um, especially if you've got kids or um, are a kid at heart. This is my kind of activity. Um, you'll be able to interact with people who are sharing with you stories of our community over time. And then I've gotten a lot of questions about this, the cemetery tour. This is one of my favorite tours I've ever done. It's the International Oddfellow Cemetery uh, on the east side of Georgetown. It's kind of tucked back behind Southwestern at the end of East 7th Street. So the east end of East 7th Street is where that uh, cemetery is located. You can get tickets on the Williamson Museum's website and it is, it's incredible. So basically you are able to go to the cemetery and again, there will be characters sharing stories of people who are buried in the Oddfellow Cemetery. And it's kind of an incredible and very fun experience. It's a great outdoors activity. Um, so you'll be able to stay socially distanced. That'll, that'll be really great. So if you need more information, please check out the Williamson Museum's website for that. Um, and we really appreciate them. We're also working with our partner Preservation Georgetown on highlighting history this month. So if you do not follow Preservation Georgetown on social media, I would absolutely give their page a check. One of the things that they are doing is sharing the places that matter um, with us. And so a lot of our community members are sharing the historic places that matter to them and a little bit of detail about that. And Preservation Georgetown's uh, website, or sorry, their Facebook page is a great way to keep track of the places that people in our community love. Um, and then also, if you need more information about Preservation Georgetown, you can visit their website. I think it's preservationgeorgetown.org. So lots of fun resources. Um, we are getting close to our end of time. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but if anybody does have questions, now would be a great time to bring those up. And then I also want to thank the Williamson Museum on our Facebook live stream. They've provided some comments that I just wanted to capture for y'all. Um, the Bastrop County, uh, which is just to the south and east of us, also has a Preston and Ruffini Courthouse with a CH page edition. So we're not the only ones. <laughs> <laughs> These were architects really popular in Texas. They let us know that the feet on Themis are four times the size of her head. So that girl has got some big shoe size. Um, so that's a really fun detail. It's stable. And, <laughs> and keeps stable. I mean, she's balancing on a ball essentially up there uh, in the wind. And you know, these spring storms have been a little bit rough. But they also uh, shared that the cemetery tour will be featuring building owners and will have historic photos at the cemetery. So even if you've been on this tour before, you probably want to go again because it sounds like they're providing even more awesome content for y'all. And we just really appreciate the work that they do to share stories in our community. So Anne, thank you as always for thank joining you. me and providing your knowledge and expertise. Um, could not thank do you. this without Anne, but also thank you to our community not members you and, <laughs> and city staff. Thanks to the Main Street program for doing such a great job supporting Preservation Month, sharing information. If you've been downtown lately, and uh, you may have seen the flyers for that, but we've got flyers that you can grab at one of our local businesses in the downtown and take home. They should have stacks of them ready for you. And as you're going downtown this month, just remember to look up and look around and see all these great layers of history that we love so much. We will be back next Tuesday with another show and really excited to share with you the history of the post office, post office. some great historic photos and what happens when the postmaster unexpectedly passes away. <laughs> I'm really excited about that one. 
So uh, thank you all so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Hope everybody has a great week and a great start to the month of May, National Historic Preservation Month.